Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Thursday, March 18th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today marks the 150th anniversary of the start of the Paris Commune, and it remains as controversial as ever. Scientists have grown a mouse embryo in an artificial womb and have set their sights on human embryos next. Speaking of controversy... And why people in Taiwan keep legally changing their names to salmon. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Today, March 18th, marks the 150th anniversary of the start of the Paris Commune. The two-month takeover of Paris by workers and revolutionaries, the first urban proletariat revolution, was long one of the most forgotten moments in France's revolutionary history, and yet in many ways one of the most influential. Eric Selbin, chair of political science at Southwestern University, explains in his book Revolution, Rebellion, and Resistance, The Power of Story, quote, Perhaps more than with any other such moment, there has been an effort actively to forget the commune. For example, during the 1989 bicentennial of the French Revolution, France's many revolutionary moments were celebrated, but the commune was notably absent. The endeavor has been to eliminate it not just from formal history, but from people's lived experience, to ensure that it does not play a part in the popular repertoire, end quote. But what exactly was the Paris Commune, and why have so many tried to obscure it from history over the years? Quoting again from Selden, In 1870, during the Franco-Prussian War, Paris had been under siege for five months, To end the impasse, the French government made substantial concessions, which were not entirely well-received by the people of Paris. Fearful of a working-class revolt, the government tried to collect the artillery it had provided for the defense of the city, and the battle was joined. Parisians refused to let the weapons, and on the 26th of March, 1871, elected the commune to govern the city. The National Assembly retreated, with no little irony, to Versailles. The commune promptly abolished the police and the army, opened public schools, and in some cases provided school materials, food, and even clothing to students, and announced the separation of church and state. Socialists, anarchists, libertarian, republicans, feminists, and others organized themselves and also worked collectively. The 1789 calendar was restored, the red flag adopted, night work in bakeries ended, pensions granted to unmarried partners of National Guard members, a guillotine ceremoniously burnt, the Vendome column torn down, and great public celebrations and concerts held. End quote. All of that in just 72 days. And so much more. As Grail Marcus described it in his book, Lipstick Traces, A Secret History of the 20th Century, quote, For the next months, almost every radical idea of the previous hundred years was dug out of the ground and put into some sort of practice, end quote. And it was in particular an achievement by and for women. Quoting the Jacobin, Women achieved the closure of licensed brothels, won parody for female and male teachers, coined the slogan, equal pay for equal work, demanded equal rights within marriage and the recognition of free unions, and promoted exclusively female chambers in labor unions. When the military situation worsened in mid-May with the Versailles at the gates of Paris, women took up arms and formed a battalion of their own. End quote. But yes, by mid-May, things were beginning to come to a head. Quoting again from Selbin, Enraged by the increasingly intransigent communards and their flouting of convention, and egged on by the newly declared German state, the Versailles forces increased their attacks and on the 21st of May entered Paris proper, whereupon the slaughter began. In what became known as La Semaine Sanglante, or the Bloody Week, tens of thousands were killed in the fighting or summarily executed following surrender. The last 150 or so famously shot against the Mur des Federés, or Communards Wall, in Père Lachaise Cemetery. Thousands more were executed, jailed, or deported to French penal colonies. Women and children were particular targets. Many decided it was better to die on their feet than live on their knees. End quote. 
While the communards were quickly stamped down and the whole affair bolstered anti-socialist sentiment across Europe's upper and ruling classes, it also inspired hope in the hearts of many, especially those in burgeoning workers' rights movements, and influenced 20th century revolutions in some major ways, often being cited admirably by Marx and Lenin, the latter of whom even had the solid red flag of the communards buried with him. Quoting again from the Jacobin, The insurrection in Paris gave strength to workers' struggles and pushed them in more radical directions. Paris had shown that the aim had to be one of building a society radically different from capitalism. Henceforth, even if the time of cherries, le tante cerise, to quote the title of the communard Jean-Baptiste Clément's famous verse, never returned for its protagonists, the commune embodied the idea of social political change and its practical application. It became synonymous with the very concept of revolution, with an ontological experience of the working class. In The Civil War in France, Karl Marx stated that this vanguard of the modern proletariat had succeeded in attaching the workers of the world to France, end quote. There is so much more to be said about the Paris Commune, its legacy, and the myriad interpretations about its intentions and impact, and those debates are playing out again today in Paris. Quoting the BBC, For three months from today, Paris's left-run City Hall has prepared commemorations focusing on what it sees as the movement's great social advances, equality for the sexes, disempowering the church, and participative democracy. But the right-wing opposition says that socialist mayor and presidential hopeful Anne Hidalgo is instrumentalizing history for political ends, end quote. Supporters and organizers of the commemoration emphasize how many themes of the commune are still alive today, how many policies and liberties they fought for are still being fought for. The Paris Commune was about people who had been severely disenfranchised rising up and creating a better world for themselves. And as the organizer of the current commemorations, Laurence Patrice, pointed out to The Guardian, quote, It was the communards who paid the highest price for the insurrection, in deaths and deportations, end quote. But at the very least, Patrice says, quote, This is about remembering an episode that is constitutive for the collective memory of the city. If you love Paris and live here, then it's important to know its history, end quote. Those who disagree with the memorializing of the commune this spring are in many ways just continuing to play out the same tradition of purposeful erasure that's been inflicted on the commune since the 1870s. But whether it's the student protests of May 1968 or, in some ways, the more recent Yellow Vest movement, there will always be those in turn invoking its name and, in one way or another, continuing the fight. Quoting historian Robert Toombs in the BBC, Most revolutionary regimes that succeed end up disappointing. Here was a revolutionary movement that didn't succeed, that didn't last that long, and therefore people are free to project onto it all sorts of things that might have happened and would have been good. So it's become an icon of feminism, secularism, of popular democracy. What it would actually have turned out as had it succeeded, we will never know. End quote. Scientists in Israel have successfully grown a mouse embryo in an artificial womb, setting the stage for similar developments with human embryos. The 11 to 12 days, or half of the mouse's gestation period, during which the scientists grew the mice embryos, marks the most developed a mammal has ever gotten outside the womb. Quoting the MIT Technology Review, the team grew the mouse embryos longer by adding blood serum from human umbilical cords, agitating them in glass jars, and pumping them in a pressurized oxygen mixture. The mouse embryos only died after they became too large for the oxygen to diffuse through them since they lacked the natural blood supply a placenta could provide. End quote. Jacob Hanna, a developmental biologist at the Wiseman Institute of Science and lead researcher on the study, said, quote, this sets the stage for other species. I hope that it will allow scientists to grow human embryos until week five. And continuing from the MIT Tech Review, Hannah believes lab-grown embryos could be a research substitute for tissue derived from abortions, and possibly a source of tissue for medical treatments as well. 
He recognizes that images of lab-grown human embryos with a roughly recognizable shape, head, tail, and limb buds, could be shocking. The human equivalent of Hannah's 12-day-old mice would be a first trimester embryo. I do understand the difficulties. I understand you're entering the domain of abortions, says Hannah. However, he says he can rationalize such experiments because researchers already study five-day-old human embryos from IVF clinics, which are also destroyed in that process. So I would advocate growing it until day 40 and then disposing of it, says Hannah. Instead of getting tissue from abortions, let's take a blastocyst and grow it. The research is part of an explosion of new techniques and ideas for studying early development. Today, in the same issue of Nature, two other research groups are reporting a leap forward in creating artificial human embryos." End quote. And though one of those teams in assembling artificial models of embryos are mere steps away from creating viable human embryos that could progress theoretically to the point of birth, the MIT Tech Review emphasizes that scientists say they would never do that, never establish pregnancy with artificial embryos, and indeed that it's forbidden in most countries. Quoting again, Long-term studies of live human embryos developing in the lab are currently banned under the so-called 14-day rule, a guideline and law in some countries according to which embryologists have been forbidden to grow human embryos more than two weeks. However, a key scientific organization, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, or ISSCR, has plans to recommend rescinding the prohibition and allowing some embryos to grow for longer. Hannah says to make such experiments more acceptable, human embryos could be altered to limit their potential to develop fully. One possibility would be to install genetic mutations in a calcium channel so as to prevent the heart from ever beating. William Hurlbut, a doctor and bioethicist at Stanford University, says the system suggests to him a way to obtain primitive organs, like liver or pancreas cells, from first trimester human embryos, which could then be grown further and used in transplant medicine, end quote. And beyond organ transplants, other benefits focus on the study of early human development within the womb, something that's usually difficult to study due to embryos usually being obscured by, you know, the womb. But, as Hurlbut emphasizes, despite all the upsides and scientific possibilities, quote, it's very fraught because one person's boundary is not another person's boundary, end quote. This week, over 150 people in Taiwan legally changed their names to Gui Yu, which means salmon. Why? To get free stuff, duh. A Japanese chain called Sushi Euro was running a two-day promotion in which anyone with Gui Yu in their name could get an all-you-can-eat meal with five friends. Which, like, yeah, that's pretty generous. A college student told the local news, quote, I just changed my name this morning to add the characters Bao Chang Gui Yu, and we already ate more than $7,000, end quote. Now, that's only about $245 in U.S. dollars, but still, that's a lot of sushi. Oh, and Bao Chang Gui Yu roughly translates to explosive good-looking salmon. According to The Guardian, some other changed names include Salmon Prince, Meteor Salmon King, and Salmon Fried Rice. The Washington Post adds a few more, Hotness Salmon, Dip Wasabi and Eat Salmon, and can't help but want to eat free salmon. There's also one guy who added a record 36 characters to his name, most of them seafood-themed. Most people, like woman who changed her first name to Salmon, plan on just changing their name back in a few days, but that whole situation is proving irksome to government officials, who have raised complaints about unnecessary paperwork and took to social media to remind people that Taiwan only allows a person to legally change their name three times. So if you changed it to Salmon and back again, you only have one left. Or, and I haven't heard of this happening yet, but if anyone had already changed their name twice, now they're stuck with Salmon. That's not a problem for 19-year-old newly dubbed Hong Salmon, though, who says he has no plans to change his name back. According to the Washington Post, he said his new name, quote, represents his courage to do whatever he wants, end quote. As far as Sushiro goes, marketing manager Dory Wong said they've had about 200 people take advantage of the promotion and that they've been floored by the enthusiasm of Taiwanese customers. 
And presumably, no matter how much all these salmon-named people and their friends managed to eat, all of the publicity has probably made up for that. But with the promotion officially over, Taiwanese officials can rest easy knowing that the salmon chaos, as it's been called, is coming to a close. And I can't help being reminded of Cafe Salmonella from the series of Unfortunate Events, a salmon-themed restaurant brilliantly and disturbingly brought to life in the Netflix series. I'll put a clip of the scene in the show notes in case you want some bonus salmon chaos in your life today. I've got more whale news for you today, sort of. Jason shared a fascinating article about how sperm whales learned to outsmart 19th century whalers by pretty quickly adopting new strategies once they realized their defensive tactics they used against orcas didn't hold up. He also shared an older post about how some scientists are studying humpback whales' communication to better learn how to potentially communicate with aliens. Both are fascinating. Check them out at the links in the show notes. But that's it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. 